great to see you. Thank you for your time. Um, those of you who've never been to the virtual pool, I'll explain that in a moment. But in the meantime, Alison's just posted into chat some details and information about ourselves rather than going through length, lengthy introductions. So, and what we'd like you to do is just to type your name and the area or school that you work in, um, just for our records really, as much as introducing yourselves virtually. So I'll just give you a minute to do that. <clears throat> One minute. OK, and before we start as well, you might want to put your microphones on mute um, so we don't get any interruptions and I will get started. So the virtual pool, for those of you that haven't been to one of our meetings before, a quick explanation. So I set up the virtual pool at the beginning of last year when public pools were closed, but schools who had pools on site were able to deliver school swimming. It was really a stressful, sort of anxious time. Um, so we, I was getting asked lots and lots of questions about how to deliver the school swimming safely and abide by all the, all the protocols and all the rules in place. So I set up the virtual pool and as you can see from the logo, the aim of the group is to connect, share and support each yeah, other through yeah. primarily, primarily yeah. school yeah. swimming. So we've got the Facebook group that you can connect with us and I often post articles or bits of interest about swimming as well as future dates of workshops. So please jump into our virtual pool. OK, so today the reason why you're here is how to use new, old and inclusive swimming equipment. We quite like this video here of these ducks floating around. So the aim for today is we're going to be looking at six pieces of equipment and how to use them creatively and purposefully. For this particular workshop, we are actually going to be looking at ducks. As you can see, there are a huge amount of ducks that you can use in your lessons. And there are also loads and loads of different types of equipment out there designed for the pool that can be adapted to make learning fun. I actually come from a PE background, so my qualification is in PE, a degree in PE, and I often use PE equipment in the pool. So do think, well, the aim of this workshop is to think creatively about how to use different types of equipment. So you not, might not necessarily be specifically designed for swimming teachers. We could add, run a much, much longer workshop covering loads more equipment, but we only have half an hour. So I hope in this half an hour will inspire you. And our aim is to deliver another workshop later on in the year, looking at another six items of equipment. So before we go any further, we're going to throw it over to you and we're going to ask you to type into chat your favourite piece of equipment and how you use it. So have you got a creative bit of equipment that you already use that you'd like to share with us and um, and how would you use it? So if you could type that into chat, that would be brilliant. Brilliant. Yeah, floating numbers, Lorna. Love floating numbers. Sinkers, balance on the tummy, absolutely. Colour balls, yeah. Hayley, love a ball. Noodles, that's great, Michael, because we're going to be looking at noodles. So some great ideas there. Brilliant. Keep typing away because in the chat function, if you don't know this, the three little dots at the bottom, you can actually save this chat at the end of the workshop. So you've got all these ideas as an extra resource as well. Thank you, Caroline. Yeah, we love a noodle. OK, so before we start the workshop looking at specific games, I just want to remind you about the STEP principle. So the STEP principle is a really useful formula in keeping your lessons inclusive. And obviously we're looking at the E today. So considering the type of equipment is really important. So what you use, why you use it and how you use it to be really inclusive in your lessons. I'm going to hand over to Alison now for our first specific piece of equipment. And she's going to be looking at sponges. Yep, sponges. 
Thank you, Lorna. Um, so I think one thing that we all perhaps need to think about um, is time to dig out the, the equipment again, um, as we haven't been out, allowed to use it really for a couple of years. Um, so sponges is something that you may not have used. Um, I've not used them myself for a long time. Um, but a, a long time ago when I was teaching, I did used to use them. I put them in my bag, very easy to transport, take into different centres that I was teaching at. I'd not used them for a long time, as I said, um, but when researching this workshop, uh, we started oh, using them again. And um, it was an absolute delight to see the expression um, on the children's faces once again with them. And you'll see that in a moment. They do come in all sorts of shapes and sizes and easy to store. You can buy in supermarkets, um, on Amazon um, and many other stores. They're cheap to buy and they're fun to use. So let's have a look at how we can use them. You can see the delight on this little boy's face here um, in just the feel and the touch of the sponge and squeezing out the water. Um, swimmers were given activities of showering themselves whilst waiting at the side of the pool. And to be honest, they didn't need asking twice. They were touching it, playing it, showering um, themselves with it. And obviously this builds water confidence and aquatic breathing. We also use them on the back, holding on the tummy for floating and kicking. The children really liked having them on their heads to keep their heads back in the water, safe and fun to use. The thing I like most about sponges is that they're an inclusive piece of equipment and they can be used in many ways um, with different types of children. So perhaps get yourself some sponges or dig them out if you used to use them um, because they are a wonderful piece of equipment. So I'm going to hand over to Lorna now and she's going to talk about rain clouds. OK, so rain clouds. So what are they? So they're plastic sensory clouds that swimmers can fill with water, watch the bubbles and then control the rain. How do they fill them water? By they submerge the cloud under the water until all the bubbles come up. I was doing this afternoon, actually. It's really good for the children to watch the bubbles. So that brings in lots of conversation about the bubbles that they can make themselves. And when the bubbles stop, when the air's gone out, they lift up the rain cloud and then they can create the rain that comes out through the holes at the bottom of the cloud. They can control the rain, they can stop it and start it by using the index finger to cover the blowhole at the top. So they're really, really fun pieces of equipment. Where can you get them? You can buy them from Amazon. Um, and I think that's the cheapest I've found. I think they're about seven pounds each. Um, but if you just Google plastic sensory clouds or plastic rain clouds for the bath, there's other uh, places that sell them too. Why do we use them? They develop the core aquatic skill of aquatic breathing, submersion and coordination. It's also really sensory. The actual tactile feel of those clouds are really lovely, as well as that sensory impact of that showering rain coming down onto the heads or other parts of their body. Also problem solving. Problem solving and trying to work out how to stop and start the rain is, is quite a good coordination as well as getting their brains working too. So I'm going to tell you how to use them now. Some activities to use. So we've got springtime here. So this is an activity I do in springtime, obviously. We've got our piece of grass in the green raft. I told you I was a PE teacher, love a PE cone. I use the PE cones as, as holes to plant our seeds, which are our coloured balls. So they go and collect the coloured balls, plant them in the seed a hole, and then obviously we discuss what the seeds need to grow. So we obviously we need water. So hence the rain clouds come in and they water the plants. We then progress that by getting the swimmers to become the seeds. So we have our seed shapes. We're developing that flotation of a mushroom float or a tuck float. You can name it whatever you like, a seed float. And we water them, water that swimmer until they stretch out and grow. So you've got a lovely contrast and sequence of flotation skills. So I'll just show you that little clip. So we've got our lovely tuck shape and he's being watered and he stretches out. So that's another idea. And we've got this little child here, obviously with complex needs. And we've got her in a uh, neck ring, which we're going to talk about flotation devices later on um, uh, in this workshop. 
and this particular flotation device is really useful for our younger swimmers in giving them some independence without risking aspiration i.e water going down their throats and they can't actually cough out i have the haven't got the reflex to cough that water out of their lungs so that keeps them relatively safe although it goes without saying she has got a one-to-one -one with her but we love these rain clouds last week because we were using the rain clouds and you can see we got a reaction where she was lifting her hand to get that lovely sensory feel of the water on her hands so it's a really inclusive piece of equipment and great fun Another activity I'd like to share with you of how to use the rain clouds is Incy Wincy Spider. So Incy Wincy Spider, I'm sure you know the song, Incy Wincy Spider climbed up the spout, down came the rain, hence the rain cloud, and washed the spider out. Out came the sunshine, dried up all the rain, and Incy Wincy Spider climbed, went, went swimming back to the spout again. So we've got our rain clouds, we've got our submersion skills. With the sun coming out, I do a lot of practice of just lying on your back in stillness and doing a horizontal rotation to swim back to the spout. And then obviously when the rain gets poured over your head, it's the cue to push and glide. So we push and glide on our backs. There's a whole host of core aquatic skills using our lovely rain cloud. So I'll just give you a, a, a clip of this to show you what I mean. It's worth saying the little girl at the end is blind. So I did give her a warning that I was going to pour water over her head so that she knew, likewise with the other children as well. So there we are, we're climbing up the spout, down came the rain, and we're going to do a push and glide on our backs. So we're going to come out, so we've practiced this, we've broken these skills down, down came the rain and washed the spider out. Then we're still, because the sun comes out, an incy wincy spider swims back, so hopefully we're going to get a little bit independent swimming with our two boys at the end there, back to the spout again. So I hope that gives you some um, uh, ideas of using the rain cloud. It also goes without saying of actually letting the children have a little bit of exploration, a bit of guided discovery of letting them play with these rain clouds. Because of, as I said, the feeling is lovely, the tactile feel, and just getting them to work out how to stop and start the rain is really, really useful and just gives them a bit of structured, supervised playtime. OK, I'm going to pass over to Alison for our next piece of equipment, which are Hoops. Okay, so um, time to dust off those hoops and get them back out the cupboard. And um, this is one of my favourite pieces of equipment because they can be used um, in so many different ways. They do come in different sizes. Um, so you can get small ones, you know, really big ones, medium sized ones, etc. But one thing I've done with these hoops um, is I have actually covered all of them with sparkle tape. Um, I've done them in many different colours and I've used hologram tape uh, with some and just wrapped it around them, just sat watching the telly wrapped them around. Some of you might be saying you need to get out a bit more, but the results have been amazing. Um, the pitch, you can see from the picture, however, it doesn't really do it justice. In real life, they are really sparkly and the swimmers absolutely love them. So let's talk about how we can use them. So the first um, first idea for you is um, we use the hoops as a space theme in lessons. So the hoops can be the planets. Swimmers can land on the planets by blowing bubbles and going into the hoops, even if you lift them up a little bit so that they can get into the hoop. Um, they can swim around the planets, um, looking at the different colours that the hoops might be. Um, you can put different objects in the planets um, for the swimmers to explore or pick up, maybe put some of those rain clouds in there, for example, and maybe they could take some objects from one planet to another planet. So you can have a whole themed um, lesson using the hoops, using space. So moving on, we can use hoops for streamlining. So push and glide through hoops, really encourage that narrow as an arrow concept for streamlining. I really like that saying, narrow as an arrow, because it gets us as streamlined as we can. When the hoops are different colours and catching to the eye, it makes the activity really exciting, um, and especially when they can choose their own colour hoop. So another idea, I don't know whether you've done this before, but we've got two short videos here. The first one um, is a, a little swimmer. And what she's going to do is she's going to somersault through the hoop. So you can have a look at that. Um, so you need to be tightly tucked, chin tucked in to get through the hoop and come up the other side. So it encourages that horizontal rotation, plus it encourages a nice tight tuck. 
So the second idea on this slide is to throw the balls, um, practicing our treading water and our hand and eye coordinations. They're gonna throw the balls into the hoops. You could have scores for points for different color hoops, etc. cetera. Um, whilst doing this, the children are treading water with one arm out, so it is improving that skill. Um, and when you've got an activity like that, you can keep them engaged for so much longer. So hoops with entries. So using the hoop for entries can really enhance the technique in many ways. Jumping into hoop creates streamlining, especially with the arms and the legs. Diving into the hoops encourages leaning forward and a narrow position. And we can progress to diving through and into hoops as we're showing you in the video here. Um, so this young lad here does have ADHD. The other piece of equipment I used with him on this session was my camera with permission. And it was my slow-mo, as you can see, that picture was taken in slow-mo. Um, and his self-evaluation was absolutely amazing. Just looking at himself, even down to what his feet were like um, on the pool side. Behind end of that half hour lesson, he, that's what he achieved. So um, it was a really successful session. And I'm sure the hoops had a lot to do with that. So I'm going to show you another idea. <clears throat> now, these are two different ways of jumping into hoops. So the first one, thinking a little bit outside the box, the hoops in front, they jump through the hoop and it goes over the top of the head. Um, the second one, the hoop is at the side and then you flick the legs through the hoop and then over the top. So one of them is in front. Just watch that one again. So in front, jumping through and over the head. So builds much more coordination. And the other one is the hoops are at the side and then they jump through sideways and over the top. So the last slide is just perhaps thinking about being creative. Um, I also used the hoops in 2016 to make Olympic rings in an artistic swimming routine. Um, you can also see on the right hand side there, um, the, the girls there are doing a tub turn. So that's the shape within the hoops. Um, but maybe what you could do is think about what else can I do inside that hoop? So it might be I'm going to hold my hands and turn around vertically in it, maybe treading water. Um, so hopefully that's got you thinking and maybe inspiring you to get those hoops out the cupboard and maybe use them a little bit more creatively. creatively. So I'm going to hand back to Lorna now. Brilliant. Thank you. OK, we're going to look at egg flips now. So what are they? So egg flips actually originated through the Halliwick founder, James McMillan. And if you don't know what Halliwick concept of teaching primarily SEND swimmers, then we did have a workshop on it and there is a recording on the virtual page that you can access. Um, the aim is to blow and flip the egg flips over. And as you can see from the pictures here, they're often two colours or two characters. So when they flip, the egg flip over, you get the different colour or the different character. I did think my, I was using them last week thinking, why didn't I use them much? And of course, they're not very COVID friendly, are they? And actually, it made me think that even still, I wouldn't actually share the egg flips around. I'd just make sure the swimmer kept their own egg flips, um, the own egg flip to themselves. So why do we use them? They develop aquatic breathing, both explosive and trickle, as well as travel and coordination. So we're going to look at how inclusive they are so you can see they're very inclusive for all ages and abilities so this is our adult and child class using it to develop that inhalation and exhalation because it's really important that swimmers as though we took to teach them to blow bubbles or hold their breath it's also about making sure they take that breath in again before they try and exhale so these are really important for getting that rhythmic breathing going um, even my more complex needs swimmers at school because i work in a special needs school OK, they'll never get they can't control their breath control at all. So that's why they've got one to one help. But they do actually use the egg flips to perhaps coordinate their hand or uh, arm action to get the egg flip to move. Um, the next picture I absolutely love because this is a student in our school who is determined to flip this egg over. And she re was really trying hard. And I did have to help a couple of times because she kept using her hands to flip them over. But she was really trying to get that exhalation and then taking a breath in and having another go. But it is worth saying it can be quite difficult. So when we think about the step principle, although this is a really great piece of equipment, we might want to change the task 
into just blowing the egg flip along. So thinking about blowing it along rather than flipping it. Activities that you can do. The Halloween have got a little game called Eggs for Breakfast where you are in a circle, perhaps using a noodle floating on your back. The eggs are in the middle. You are lying in bed, fast asleep. Alarm goes off. Up we go. Horizontal rotation, leaning forward to get your egg flip, retrieve the egg flip or retrieve it and then blow it onto a plate, perhaps. You might also want to use the egg flips as literal eggs and scatter them around the, the pool and return them to the nest. You can also do races where they're traveling, perhaps across the width of the pool, blowing their egg flip into a particular pot or using the cones again. Um, and also problem solving of just saying to them, let, let them have a go and say, right, I want you to flip it over. How are you going to do it without using your hands? So lots of ideas. Egg flips, really, really good piece of equipment for aquatic breathing as well as traveling coordination. OK, I'm going to pass over to Alison for our noodle section. OK, so I wished I'd invented the noodle and I expect many of you on the call wish you had because they're so useful, so effective to learning and having a good time in the pool. So you can see from the first picture there from the photo that you can make canoes by putting small sinkable rings around each end. This becomes a social activity and promotes travel and teamwork and the children absolutely love that activity. The second picture is um, showing them going under a rainbow, as you can see, using the noodle holders to the side. So that's what's making the rainbow there. This motivates learners to go under and you can see that the learner here is blowing bubbles under the rainbow. So developing independent skills aquatic breathing and travel. If you have a pool where you can put the noodles in a rail um, you can make a bigger rainbow as you can see from that last picture um, and also that enables them to swim a further distance or walk a further distance. If you put them on their back they would be able to look up and maybe tell you the colours, count them. Um, there's a number of other skills um, cross curricula that you could bring into that activity, including streamlining. So let's have a look at the next activity. I expect most of you have used these two activities. So the first picture, um, she's sitting on a swing. It's quite difficult to see, but you might be able to see just that blue um, noodle there. But it's great. One of the activities I really like here is teaching egg beater leg kick where the knees need to be in a like sitting position. And then you've got the legs um, working inwards and that really does help um, to get that action correct. Um, in the next picture, you can see sitting on it like a horse, which in itself is absolute a lot of fun. Um, but you can teach sculling, for example, uh, whilst they're sitting there, which um, gives balance technique. But the other thing I really like is you're able to see the teacher. So you've got really good communication of showing them the position of the hands uh, for sculling, whether you're going head first sculling, flat skull or feet first sculling. It's just a really good way of getting that communication there. And you can also use it to teach different leg kicks, such as cycle leg kicks, breaststroke leg kicks, scissor leg kicks, etc., for treading water. So another trick um, that you can do with the noodle, and I'm sure you've all done this at some point, is tie it in a knot. Um, and there's so many different ways that you can use it. So the picture at the bottom on the left hand side, um, you can see we used um, the noodles as motorbike handles instead of floats. And I have to say, we did this last week when I took the pictures um, and the children were just really excited um, to use the motorbike rather than the float. Um, so that in itself just creates engagement and motivation. Um, the top pictures show our noodle motor, motorbike. Um, be on the air of caution is do this with swimmers that are a little bit more able because it requires quite a lot of balance. We did do this with a deep end group. Um, it really encourages guided discovery because I have to work out how to move on this noodle. And we had lots of different types of leg action and all sorts of things. So you can encourage them to move forwards, move backwards, maybe play a game, not bumper cars, but maybe moving in different directions to challenge their agility skills. 
what a great way to warm up a bit more able group when sometimes we find it more difficult perhaps to find those games for those swimmers. Um, so I hope that um, inspires you a little bit there. The next one, one of my favourites, a good old McDonald's sign on the left hand side. Um, perfect for travelling under, um, through and in different ways. And this also allows a slightly higher activity levels within your classes because two can go mm. through at any one time. And you can also, if you're in the water, you can hold a noodle each um, to make that McDonald's sign. The picture on the right, one of my little um, perhaps hobby horses, um, when you're teaching sculling or floating, um, we sometimes expect children to, to learn the sculling and then kind of not teach the body position. So by tying um, those noodles into knots, they can hold on to that. They can practice breathing in to, to enable the flotation to be a little bit more enhanced but you can teach them squeezing those legs together, different shapes, so they can float um, and able to learn what it feels like, which is so important. So the last thing I want to show you, just share three more ideas. So the first picture on the left, difficult to see, but this young lady is sitting on a tied noodle. So again, practicing sculling and balancing. We've got Drowning Prevention Week coming up in June, so we could do reach and rescues. And why not, the last one, why not let your swimmers wear it as a hat for a bit of fun? I think we could do about three hours on how to use a noodle, um, but I hope there's something new there, or if not new, something reminding you of what we can do. So I'm gonna hand back to Lorna for our next bit of equipment. Brilliant, thank you. All right, so the last piece of equipment we're going to look at are flotation mats and floats. Now, there are a wide range of flotation aids on the market from armbands to floats and obviously to noodles, which Alison just talked about. But I just thought I'd introduce you to these mats that you might not know about. Obviously, we use them in our school. We've had one for about 20 years. But this guy in the photograph, Martin Mansells, took over the company about 15 years ago I think and has developed the product even further and they're amazing they're a bit expensive but the website here on the slide floatstation.com there is funding available um, and they are mats that support the swimmers comfortably and slightly under the water to maintain body temperature and the blurb that's actually on his website tells you that it's a swimming aid made of a unique matrix of balls giving total support without rubbing the body actually they're really soft they're flexible and promote independence. And this is a real crux of Martin's products in that they are for people of all abilities, disabled, non-disabled, young and old. And I can't tell you, as soon as the kids are off them, my TAs want to get them on, and I do as well, actually. They're really lovely and supportive, being keeping you underwater to keep you warm. Um, obviously, we're going to look at a different other range of uh, floats that can assist uh, swimmers as well. And obviously, I mentioned that neck ring that I used for my um, little girl with, with the rain cloud that we saw earlier. Why use these floats? Why use aids in the first place? I think it really importantly, it gives them independence. So it gives them independence from being handled, particularly in my school, when you think of special needs where there perhaps are more complex needs children who are all in their wheelchairs and always being hoisted and lifted and manhandled. To have an experience in the water where they're not being held, I think is invaluable. Likewise, with these flotation mats, we can have two on at a time without them affecting the balance at all. It doesn't wobble, doesn't make one go under if you t if the other person jumps on. So the social skills of having two on the mat at the same time. And also they're just fun. They're really good fun. OK, so just to prove that we've got this little boy here, obviously uh, normally in a wheelchair, normally lots of support. He's on his own. And we're trying to get a little bit of work on his back on his armbands and we actually wrap our swimmers up in these as well so if you think of an anxious swimmer that weight of that extra weight of the like one of those weighted blankets you might have heard about gives them a feeling of security in the water too this one here you can see how manually uh, uh, malleable they are and we can roll it up tuck his head up so he lifts up a little bit more so he can have a little bit more eye to eye contact with the people who he's working with We've got this little boy. This is a really lovely brand new product out from Martin's company called a citrus pocket. And there's a pocket in the middle here where the balls, once the child sits on it, move away and then support the back and the head, which you can see there. So it's keeping him under the water and keeping him relative, relatively warmer while comfortable and also not being held, as you can see. 
TA, loving it. This this child here, she's our reg flip person as well. She absolutely loves. We have a bit of chill time at the end of the session, and she likes nothing better than to. Well, she just chats away to herself and just loves being comfortable and secure and without being held on to anybody. Our next slide shows another flotation aid that we use. We're lucky enough to have um, invested in some therapy this year called liquid vibration, where we've been trained to de deliver Watsu, which is basically massage in the water with the addition with liquid vibration have got underwater speakers. So we have our, so our swimmers have our, their ears in the water and they're supported with these floats that are just rested above their knee. Some swimmers might need an extra float above their ankles, but again, in mainstream, you might have you might have a swimmer who finds it really hard to get, as Alison talks about, that body position. So giving those extra buoyancy aids might give them the confidence then to be able to get their head back and to develop the skills even further. Another flotation aid we use that you might see in a leisure centre or a school and not have a scooby-doo what it's all about. So this is a head support here. So it's like a little backpack, the black thread goes round behind his back and weaves upwards and through and you tighten it so that it secures his head and obviously we're exploring different aids to keep his uh, legs and his body up so he wasn't because otherwise if he didn't have that he'd be in a more vertical position and then slide out of that head support i personally love this picture because this was in the height of a pandemic last year where we couldn't get in the water for our children to support them so I organised a family splash where the parents came in to support, change and support their swimmers. And I just kept my two metres distance and um, just to be there as a, an extra body and a lifeguard. So anyway, brilliant because it gives them the independence. And the other thing well, I'm going to show you in a moment, we actually do a bit of turbulent gliding under that to get him moving through the water, which I can show you now. So this little boy, slightly different head support. It's a soft pillow from Watsu, actually. I ordered it from Watsu. This little boy's got um, floats above his knees as well. And he's completely independent. So this child's normally in an electric wheelchair and he's in the water. He's got a lovely stretch body position. I'm behind him. I'm not physically holding him at all. And under the water, if you went came onto our Halliwick um, workshop last week, you would have heard us talking about turbulent gliding. And this is a really good illustration of what it is if you weren't there. So I'm just creating a current by doing a circular action with my hands just underneath his shoulders. And slowly but surely that speed picks up so he can feel that fundamental movement skill of gliding, that kinesthetic feel of moving through the water without being dragged, without being assisted in any way, apart from me creating that current under the water. Really useful skill if you've got a swimmer in mainstream who's just learned to swim on their back or, as Alison said, got that body position, you can just go behind and do this turbulent gliding to get them moving, which can be very motivational. I'll just show you another clip from another angle. So we've got the turbulent gliding going, the current's created, and you can see now he's moving actually without me doing anything now because the current's there. And you can see that lovely stretch that he's got being supported by these lovely, comfortable flotation aids. So I just thought I'd share that with you. Oh, before we do that. So just to sum up then, um, because we've come to the end of our workshop, we've looked at six items of equipment. So we've looked at our noodles, our egg flips, our sponges, our hoops, rain clouds, and some different flotation devices. We hope that the workshop's given you some ideas on how to use equipment to promote inclusion and creativity. And before we go, we'd just like to leave you with a piece of equipment and ask you to consider how would you use this? What could you use it for? It, great fun. There's lots of things we can do with it. We haven't got time now, but we will be back later on in the year with some ideas on how to use the dice as well as some other equipment. So we'll look at different equipment perhaps in September, October, but the dates will go up on the virtual call. So what's next? Our next workshop on the 13th of June is a workshop exploring dyslexia and dyspraxia. If you missed the workshop on ADHD and the other one on autism, again, we will be repeating them later on in the year. Our next virtual pool meetings are taking place. Obviously, we've just done this one. It will be recorded, as you know. So if any of your colleagues have missed it, it will be on the Facebook page by the end of the week. As Alison mentioned, Drowning Prevention Week's coming up in June. We both love that week. We do it at swim school, we do it in school. Really important to impart those water safety messages, particularly before the summer holidays. 
And it's always difficult because some children aren't swimming at school. So we've devised a workshop looking at how to deliver a water safety assembly, including some signing. And the assembly obviously targets the whole school as well as the staff and any adults who attend that assembly. So we'll be looking at that on May the 23rd. And also finally, our last one of this academic year, we're going to be looking at how to plan for next year and how to think about some inspir inspiring activities to include on your series of lessons.